And so with that, we move to the second paper. It's a pleasure to introduce Maria Sunta Gianetti, who will present a paper also on supply chain shortages, but focusing on the role of market power of large firms. And then we have the discussion by uh, Almut Balea from the RWE Institute. So, please. So, so thank you for having me here. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be at another network uh, that is uh, organized by Philippe. At the beginning of my career, I benefited a lot from a network on financial integration. So it is, uh, I'm very happy to be here again. So I will talk about the sh uh, supply chain shortages as well. Uh, and uh, I will have a very different take because uh, consistent with my and my co-author expertise, we look at microdata and we will look at the, um, the effect of supply chain shortages, how they differ between firms and how they differ between industries. And also I don't have to convince you that the supply chain shortages were important during uh, the pandemic period uh, when uh, they hit uh, the headlines. Uh, but uh, actually, if we look at the data or uh, if we think of uh, events uh, like uh, um, Japanese earthquake, uh, Thai floods, uh, these events have been affecting uh, some industries around the world uh, before. So we will try to learn from uh, a longer uh, panel. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have uh, a micro approach and uh, what we are uh, interested in understanding is uh, whether when uh, supply chain shortages occur, some uh, companies' competitive uh, position actually improves uh, relative to other. And of course, uh, if this was the case, uh, um, supply chain shortages would affect uh, competition would affect the pricing and uh, ultimately this shock could be related to inflation. So what do we have in mind? We have a very simple uh, theoretical framework in order to motivate uh, our analysis. So our intuition is that uh, when supply chain shortages occur, Suppliers, as they have been shown in many other contests, they might favor their most important customers. So for instance, Lucas work on trade credit that provides lots of evidence of this. So this might happen when suppliers have to, show, as, have to decide to whom to deliver the inputs. So what happens if the largest companies that I will call a superstar in consistent with previous literature get relatively more delivery? Well, the, a supply chain shortage shock will increase differences in cost between firms in an industry. So what if we um, think of this and the effect on the industry equilibrium? Well, is we solve this using a very simple um, uh, Cournot model. And basically what um, the model imply is that, well, if the difference in cost between the largest company in an industry and the smaller one increase, the uh, larger companies will be able to increase their market shares and also mark up. So this is something that doesn't derive from a poor cost pass-through, but is rather an effect that derives from a decrease in competition, deriving from the fact that now the cost advantage of a superstar company is larger. So basically at the micro level, what we expect to observe is that supply chain shortages should be um, related to an increase in market share, markup and profits of the largest company in the industry. Now let's think of what happens in terms of industry equilibrium. In which industry should this effect that we have in mind be more important? Well, this supplier favoritism should arise to a larger extent 
in industries in which uh, firm size is uh, more widely distributed and uh, in industries in which uh, there are uh, relatively more large firm uh, coexisting uh, with small firms. So basically in terms of uh, our um, simple uh, Cournot model, what uh, this would imply is that uh, when uh, there is uh, uh, an asymmetric shock to the cost of the firm uh, in the industry arousing from shortages, industry concentration increases more in uh, industries uh, that are ex ante more concentrated. Now this is interesting because uh, it has an effect uh, on uh, markups. Again, if we take literally the Cournot model that we use as a workhorse for illustrative uh, reasons, what we have is that in equilibrium there is a structural uh, relationship between the HHI in the industry and the aggregate markup in the industry. That is, well, relatively more of the, product, of the output is provided by the largest company, but the largest companies are the ones that receive the inputs that are producing closer to their optimal points and are those for which costs increased to a lower extent. So this is static, is how can we relate this to inflation? Well, in order to relate it to inflation is uh, we think in terms of a change of the equation that uh, you see in the slide, that is, uh, there is a, a cost shock that in industries that have ex ante higher concentration leads to a higher increase in concentration that leads to a higher increase in markup. So this is our conceptual framework that motivates the kind of empirical facts that I will go and look at in the data. So in order, of, um, uh, to, in order to tell you where we are going to aim, let me give you a preview of the results. So I'm here because indeed when we look at the firm level, what we observe is that the results are consistent with the idea that one effect of supply chain shortages is to increase differences in costs between firms. That is, we observe that concentration in, in, uh, in industries uh, increased, the star firms have been suffering less from supply chain shortages and actually they are profits increase the relative to the uh, smaller competitors and their markup as well. What are the mechanisms behind uh, um, these uh, results? Well, first of all, all our story is based on an asymmetric effect of the supply chain shortages on the cost of these companies. And uh, using uh, micro data, we can document uh, that evidence uh, is uh, consistent with that. But uh, the basic story that is uh, behind uh, our idea is uh, that there is uh, this supplier favoritism. Can we show that in the data? Well, uh, we show it uh, in uh, two different uh, ways. Most uh, of uh, our empirical analysis uh, is uh, conducted on an international sample, so the US and Europe are as important. But in order to pin down the mechanism, uh, we purchased uh, data on uh, maritime imports uh, to uh, the US. And uh, from uh, this uh, data, we observe uh, precisely who the supplier is and uh, to whom is shipping. So we can document that indeed in periods of supply chain shortages, that is not only during the um, COVID crisis, suppliers tend to ship more according to many different metrics that I will show you to their largest customers. That is, star firms obtain the shipment and can produce at their optimal uh, point uh, level. And uh, if we extend this analysis to the international sample for which we don't have the shipment, what we can show is that we have a customer suppliers link so we can look a bit as we are used to doing banking 
at uh, the customers of the same firm. So our, uh, our hypothesis would imply that the larger customers of a given firm should perform relatively better in periods of supply chain shortages. And this is precisely what we are able to show. So based on this micro evidence, we go a bit more aggregate and we try to explain what happened at the industry level. So what do we find? Well, we find that indeed, industries that are ex ante more concentrated experience a higher increase in concentration when the supply chain shortages occur, and that industries that are relatively more concentrated when supply chain shortages occur um, experience higher inflation. So this is uh, on average true in a sample period that uh, starts in the beginning of 2000, but of course the result is much stronger during the uh, COVID pandemics. And just to give you an idea, if I think in terms of cross-sectional differences between industry, we explain about 24% of the vari variation in realized inflation. So basically what we provide is a channel and empirical evidence to explain why in equilibrium competition may have decreased during the pandemic period leading to an inflation shock. So the data that, uh, let me uh, jump over the related literature in the sake of time and let me talk about the data. The data that uh, we use uh, are fairly standard, so when I will talk about uh, firm level data, I, we actually um, mostly work with uh, larger listed companies from uh, Wallscope. And uh, I will then, uh, uh, then in order to construct the production network, for the international sample, I will just uh, use uh, customer supplier links uh, from uh, fact set, so basically what I observe is important customers. But uh, I will also use this data on maritime shipment from Pajiva, and then basically keeping constant these overseas suppliers, I will, I will be able to look exactly at who are they shipping to. What I have to, um, I want to stress a bit more is uh, how do I capture the presence of supply chain shortages between industries and between different geographical areas. So what we do in the current version of the paper is that we obtain purchase manager indexes from S&P and we have a measure that varies between broad industries and geographical area. What is this measure capturing? Well, the underlying data that, of course, we don't have from S&P are a survey in which companies are asked whether their suppliers are late in delivering inputs. And basically, the delay is measured relative to the previous quarter. So if you look at this figure, basically, um, we, I will base all the presentation on the delivery time. So what you see is how supply chain shortages are becoming stronger over the previous quarter. So this is, this kind of measure is sort of already a change. We, we plan to measure shortages in a future version of the paper, so also constructing an in, uh, index based on the maritime shipment, but uh, currently we are not yet there. So delivery delays will be our uh, measure for supply chain shortages. So let's look at uh, some uh, empirical evidence. So how do we perform our empirical analysis? So we start from the firm level test. And uh, again, we will relate the firm level uh, performance of a firm that is in a given industry and in a given country in a given year. 
to um, uh, the measure of supply chain shortages, but uh, crucially, what we are interested in is not much the direct effect of supply chain shortages that may capture many other shocks, but how within the industry different firms are performing. So what I will test is whether as star companies tend to perform relatively better. What is a superstar here? Well, we define a superstar as the top 10% of companies in an industry worldwide. So, and then we will saturate, uh, we saturate the effect, uh, the equation with fixed effects, and all what I will show you today is based on differential performance between, within a country, industry, and year. So what do we find? We start from market shares and profitability. And what you observe here is that, well, when we increase delivery times by our standard deviation, basically the market share and profitability of a superstar firm increase respectively by 10% and 40%. Of course, this is relative to smaller firms in their own industry. But this is basically consistent with the evidence that has been often noted that during the pandemics, firm profitability has actually increased. So could this just be due to cost shocks and differences in markup? And this is what has been widely stressed in existing literature. So our mechanism has a different flavor because it is based in on a change in competition that uh, is typically uh, not uh, something that is underlying uh, stories uh, based on pass-through. So how do we try to uh, test uh, for this? We do two types of tests. First, uh, we focus on uh, energy shocks. So why are uh, energy shocks uh, interesting for us? Well, uh, energy is not rationed. Any company that want to pay the current price can purchase oil and gas. So we wouldn't necessarily expect the same effects arising from supply chain shortages. And therefore, we substitute a measure for energy cost to our proxy for delivery delays. And what you observe is that there is no evidence that the superstar firms are less affected by energy shocks. And this is the case also when we consider firms in industries that are more energy dependent. Then we look at the markup in order to um, microfound our uh, channel. So what is markup here? Well, uh, we, um, we use uh, several measures of, of markup, uh, all uh, inspired by the locker and uh, co-authors uh, uh, um, production approach. And uh, what you observe here is that, uh, again, consistent with uh, our mechanism, what you observe is that star firm markup have increased in period of supply chain shortages. And that the effect um, is there for the full sample and is there also for the COVID period. With in this context, we revisit the mechanism of the uh, cost pass-through. Specifically, we ask, does this effect of delivery delays on uh, higher markup for star company might depend on the fact that the star companies have a different pass-through? Using uh, company financial statements, we are able to measure 
cost shock, meaning that we observe the change in the cost of goods sold. So not only we can control for the cost, uh, for changes in the cost of goods sold, but I can also allow star firms to have a different pass-through of the effect of the cost of goods sold. And what you observe is that this effect for sure doesn't subsume our mechanism that is based on, uh, um, that is competition driven. So, and uh, basically these differences in performance between star firms and other firms within the industry in periods of supply chain shortages appear also when we look at the st uh, stock returns. So basically what we argue is that um, realize the shocks uh, to supply chains uh, can help explain why large companies have been uh, basically driving uh, the positive market uh, stock market performance uh, that uh, we have been uh, seeing uh, in uh, the last few years. So let's go through the mechanism. Again, our mechanism is based on an asymmetric effect of supply chain shortages on the cost of goods sold. And then we will test also the mechanism based on supply chain favoritism. So here you see that indeed changes in cost of goods sold are um, different between a large firms and other firms and in particular, in periods of uh, supply chain shortages, the cost of goods sold of superstar firms increases to a lower extent. So, but is, true that this is it true that this depends on the fact that suppliers favor larger customers in periods of shortages? So we use the data on shipment from Panjiva, and we are, so here my unit of observation will be the relationship. That is, for each supplier, I am able to observe the US customers, and therefore I can fully absorb the supplier's ability to ship goods using supplier and time fixed effects. So what do we observe? What you have here is different measures of flow of goods to a given suppliers to different customers. And we look at this both on the extensive and the intensive margin. So whether we look at whether anything is shipped during a quarter, the number of container, number of shipment, weight, volume, quantity, we continue to find that in, when delivery times from suppliers to customers in an industry increase, star firms receive more of the input. And the effects are uh, substantial. So for instance, if I try to measure the size of the shipment in terms of a number of containers, what I have is that shipment to superstar firms, this very large company, are 43% larger. I um, can try to look at this in my larger sample. So what I will have here is that my unit of observation is still the relationship. I can still absorb a supplier level shock using interaction of supplier firm and time fixed effect. And then I look at the measure of performance based on market share and profitability. And uh, basically, the earlier, more micro-founded result uh, is uh, fully supported. So there is another mechanism that I didn't mention yet that uh, can contribute to the competitive advantage of these uh, larger companies. And is uh, basically assortative matching. So this is a largely an empirical question. In general, in international trade, what we know is that the largest companies have more global supply chains. And in principle, they could have been relatively more exposed to shocks. 
But uh, there is an alternative mechanism that uh, might be of work. And the alternative mechanism is that very large companies tend to have very large suppliers. So if uh, a large, uh, if a star company has a star supplier, also the supplier will be less affected by supply chain shortages, sort of amplifying our mechanism. So what we observe is that this mechanism is at work. Star firms are more likely to be associated with star firms, and therefore, also from this assortative matching channel, is a selection channel, reinforces our finding. So we consider a possible alternative mechanism in the paper. For instance, our delivery delays and firm size could be capturing exposure to financial constraints. We don't find that uh, controlling for um, cash holding, access to external financial markets affects our results. Also, we don't find that our results are driven by the fact that these star companies have more operational flexibility, for instance, because they have higher inventories. So let's go to the industry level analysis. So far, I've been focusing on firms, but uh, is uh, what happened at the industry level? So again, if uh, uh, controlling for the cost shock, these uh, supply chain shortages uh, have led to higher inflation. What I should observe within my conceptual framework is that um, industry concentration increases more in industries that are ex ante more concentrated when supply chain shortages occur. So this is uh, um, what I will go on uh, and test in, again, for the US and uh, for uh, the advanced uh, uh, economies. So what uh, do we observe here? Well, uh, we observe that uh, consistent with uh, our hypothesis uh, in uh, extended more concentrated industries, uh, when there are supply chain shortages, we observe uh, a larger increase in the HHI. So then we go to, um, we consider the effect on inflation, but I will estimate reduced forms. So basically what I'm doing here is that I am relating the supply chain shortages shock to the ex ante HHI of an industry. So what do we observe? Well, both in the full sample and especially if I focus on the COVID period, what I observe is that uh, um, in, uh, the increase in inflation within an industry in these periods of supply chain shortages has been larger in ex ante more concentrated industries. And uh, I can control uh, for uh, cost shock experience by different industries uh, and also for different uh, pass-through. I, um, we uh, look at uh, different measures for uh, industry concentration. So for instance, whether industries have uh, um, superstar firms and what is uh, the proportion of superstar firms. And uh, basically is uh, uh, within this context, uh, what uh, I can show you is that uh, if we increase by one standard deviation uh, the measure of uh, uh, proportion of superstar firms uh, of superstar firm sales in an industry, and uh, I look at periods with relatively higher supply chain shortages, we are able to explain some 24 percent of cross-sectional differences in inflation between uh, industries. And uh, what you see here is that uh, the effects are both uh, qualitatively and quantitatively si uh, similar if uh, I split the sample between uh, European Union and uh, um, the US. So let me uh, wrap up. What I've shown you is that uh, 
um, not only cause shock were important, but uh, to some extent, when these supply chain shortages occur, we have uh, to take into account uh, that uh, the effect uh, is uh, not homogeneous uh, between, between uh, firms uh, in an industry. And uh, since uh, there is overwhelming evidence uh, in um, uh, firm level studies uh, that uh, suppliers uh, tend uh, to favor uh, their larger customers uh, in uh, many different ways, is, uh, it is uh, not uh, very surprising that uh, this uh, favoritism emerges uh, to a large extent also in periods of supply chain shortages. So this mechanism can help explain why when supply chain shortages occur, competition decreases and why prices can increase at the same time as profit margin. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Maria Sunta. And then we move to the discussion by Almut, please, 15 minutes. Okay, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, discuss this very interesting paper, uh, which touches upon um, um, a very important point which we all care about, what drives inflation. Um, and as Maria Sunta already said, um, what's the point here is really not only to think about how supply shocks themselves drive inflation, but how supply shocks affect something else that you know, is visible in what we call markups and that you can re relate to competition and how that then in turn drives inflation. And obviously you can relate that to a very popular or unpopular narrative of you know, do we see something like greedflation um, um, in, in the data or not and how important is it if you think that gaining market share is something we could call greed or not, or at least that's how the paper is written and motivated. Um, so if uh, a paper tries to address this unpopular or popular question, obviously then there will be a lot of pushback um, on the story. And I think the, the narrative that the paper um, tells you is, uh, is somehow convincing. Uh? So uh, or it's, easy, it's easy to believe that narrative. Uh? So it works as follows, um, and you already explained that really well. Um, we have these supply chain shortages. There's a lot of evidence on that, so that, that's a fact. And then, it may be that some firms are exposed differently to these supply chain shortages, which we could think of as cost shocks, um, than other firms. And if these are particularly large firms, or as the paper calls them, superstar firms, then you know, um, that, that basically gives them a better competi competitive position, and maybe they use that in order to gain market share. And um, so this lower exposure to supply chain shortages enables firms to, to gain market power, and if that market power is then used um, um, to pass through higher prices to consumers, we would actually see something, an increase in inflation that we may or may not, if we want to use that term, uh, call greedflation or not. So the narrative um, depends on these three steps and all of these three steps um, basically falling or going together. And what the paper does, it has, and you uh, spent quite some time um, talking about that, it has a stylized model on the relationship between firm-specific cost or exposure to cost and competition. So basically, these first two points that uh, I have on the slides here. And then you collect um, um, a lot of data from different sources, so you call micro data, but it's actually measured at different levels. Sometimes it's more firm level, sometimes more um, um, sectoral level, it comes from different countries, um, different time um, horizon, but that assembles information on supply chain shortages, profitability, markups, and consumer price inflation, both inside and outside the pandemic. So that in itself is a, already a big contribution, I would say. It's, it's very insightful to see it. And then Maria Sunta and her co-authors use these data to run um, different empirical exercises, let's say, to um, convince us that all of these three steps or all of these three parts of the narrative uh, fall in place. Um, so you show in particularly that the profitability of markups decreases less in large firms, or let's call them superstar firms, uh, when supply shocks occur. 
um, you show us that large or superstar firms can in, in fact increase their market shares um, with whatever measure you use um, in order to measure that. And then inflation rises more strongly after supply shocks in sectors with higher concentration. That was the last bit. And this last bit is important because that you then use in order to make the point that tw um, uh, 20, uh, you said 24% of inflation um, during the pandemic can be explained by this mechanism. Um, okay. So what I will do is um, um, I will assess the, the, the assumption we start with in order to, um, to go into this narrative and the very last step um, on whether this actually drives inflation or not. Yeah, so I will, I will tackle your, um, your story from the end, let's say, from the very starting point and, and the very end. So let's, let's start with the first um, point. So what we need to believe in order to you know, tell this story is that there is um, um, different firm exposure to supply side constraints. So what the paper does is it, it uses firm level information on finances and suppliers. So you explained this really well. So we know um, who the customers are, we know who the suppliers are. Um, and then you have information which you didn't talk about in, in detail from the survey of purchasing managers on these delivery times of inputs and also on supplier backlogs. So this is sectoral information. Yeah, so what you basically do is you look at the composition of suppliers of a particular firm, you see what sectors they are in, and then you match the information from the purchasing manager index to that. So that means um, that the measure is more a sectoral measure of exposure to supply shocks than an actual firm measure unless the comp sectoral composition of suppliers varies a lot within a sector. Yeah, so, so we should think of this as a sectoral level of exposure to um, supply um, constraints where we then see that some firms increase profitability more than others. We should not think of this measure, at least that's my interpretation, as a firm-specific measure of um, exposure to sectoral shocks that we, we don't see, and you don't claim that. Right? We don't see that. Um, so, so that's obviously one point you can take further. So we don't really actually see different differential exposure to these supply shocks. We just see that profitability in these sectors that are generally more exposed is different for some firms than for others. But we don't really know why. So then obviously it matters a lot that your supply shortage measure is something that actually measures changes in costs rather than changes in demand maybe, uh, which we, we would also see in differential profitability outcomes. Um, so the, the measure you focused more on is the delivery time of suppliers, which I think is a really good measure of uh, supply constraints because that really measures upstream pressure on the supply chain. The backlog measure that you did not talk that much about may not be such a good measure because that obviously could be downward pressure um, on demand, uh, which you may not necessarily want to measure here. Um, so you cannot directly test the differential exposure with your data. You can do that if you go to firm level data. And there is really good firm level data for many European countries that can actually measure this directly. So let me show you some, <laughs> some of that data. This is the German data, but there's, it, it, it exists in other European countries as well. It's from the IFO survey, which is a big firm level survey data for Germany that underlies the climate, um, business climate index. Um, so it's leading managers answering the surveys, representative for manufacturing. We can also look at outside and inside the COVID recession. So here we have a question on whether the um, domestic production is constrained by lack of materials or pre-materials, which is the um, um, inputs by suppliers. It's very closely linked to the delivery time question that um, you have in your purchasing manager index. Um, and here, because we have a firm level data, we can actually look at heterogeneity in these supply constraints. Um, um, okay, so this is a, a plot from that. What we see um, when we look at this data is that between industry variation accounts for only 3.2% of the total variation. And that means obviously in reverse that there's a lot of within heterogeneity in these um, firms answering whether they're exposed to um, production cons supply constraints or not. Uh, which is exactly what you need for your story because you want differential exposure within narrow industries, the same product market essentially of differential firms. Uh, so that, that's good, that goes in the favor of your story that we actually have a variation in exposure. Then the next question is obviously which firms are this? So here I took a very crude measure of large or small which may not exactly link to your superstar definition. Yeah? Um, and in our data, at least, we do not see a higher likelihood of large firms to be exposed to these material constraints. 
uh, or to these supply chain shortages. It may be if you do different sample that's more closely linked, you could do this in this data, then you will get um, um, a higher likelihood of these firms to actually be exposed to these supply shops. Uh, but that's something you could do um, in, in micro data. Um, Okay, then the you know tackling your narrative from the from the very last um, point of view. If if we then believe that you know maybe there is differential exposure to supply chains, and you um, um, you use that in order to gain market share, and I think that is the a strong part of the paper because you have a model that. Um, um, that explains how you gain market share if you have differential cost exposures. You have a lot of data assembled that you know, makes this point very convincing. Then obviously the elephant in the room in order to tell the story about greedflation is do, does this then also map into price decisions and into inflation? Uh, so here, is, and you showed this in the end, you run a, a sectoral regression that shows us that in industries with higher um, exposure to supply constraints um, and that are more concentrated, the CPI is higher. But we don't know which of these firms drive inflation in these industries and which do not. Your narrative tells us it should be the firms that are less exposed to the supply shocks uh, because they gain market share and they increase prices. Um, Again, you could look at firm level data with pricing decisions and directly see whether the firms that actually are exposed or less exposed to these supply shocks, you know, what, what type of price decisions do they take? Are these actually the firms that increase the prices or they increase the prices by more and therefore actually drive inflation? Um, so you do not have that direct evidence, but you could do it. And, you know, as I said, I think this is the elephant in the room because obviously most mechanisms that we know in macroeconomic models would tell us if you gain a market share or in order to gain market share in an industry, what you would do is probably you would decrease prices. Now, if you have a cost advantage um, as a firm over other firms, what you would do is first at least, <laughs> you would decrease prices and then maybe only eventually after concentration has changed in your favor, then you would increase prices. So it could be if we see an increase in inflation in a sector with a high exposure to supply constraint, it could be the small supply constraint firms that increase prices and not necessarily the large, less constrained firms that increase prices, which is not exactly in line with your, with your story or your mechanism. It maybe would call for different um, policy conclusions. So again, you know, you could look, I mean, I think you could directly try and look at, at firm level data. Um, so here I have some evidence that is, again, not exactly what you would need in order to uh, put the narrative together, but um, that would give you at least an inkling on that we have to think about this more uh, carefully, I think. Uh, so this is a local projection where we look at an expansionary monetary policy shock and distinguish supply and unconstrained, supply constrained and unconstrained firms in this E4 data that I previously showed and look at their price responses, so firm level price responses. And clearly you see that like the predominant um, uh, message here is that the supply constraint, those firms that actually do face these supply constraints, those increase prices predominantly. That's the red line on the left-hand side. Whereas the firms that are not constrained or they do not face, they may be less exposed to these supply constraints. That's the blue line on the left-hand side. They do not increase prices um, as strongly or as much. This is actually a frequency of price changes. So, you know, like in your story, we would think that these unexposed firms, they should be the ones that increase prices. Maybe they don't do that initially, but at least eventually, um, um, they should become more and more important. Uh, but um, if this is an important mechanism to understand inflation, we would at least hope that this difference between these two firms is much smaller than what we see here. Again, this is maybe not exactly the sample you would need in order to compare that to, um, to the evidence you showed us, but it's something you can do in microdata to make the story more convincing and to go this last mile to also say then, you know, if, I, if we think that competition has changed um, due to supply shock exposure, we would actually also see consequences um, in inflation um, because of that. Okay. So the last point I want to make is, and what I was missing from the paper is really a stand on, now what does this now mean for economic policy? Uh, so you're very silent about that, and it's probably also because it's difficult to make, um, or tricky to make stance on economic policy. But what I think is you show, 
most convincingly in the paper is that the, the, you know, there is an effect on competition, uh, or there is an effect on market shares or concentration. Maybe I shouldn't call it competition. Yeah, and that would obviously call a clear message for economic policymakers to monitor at least, or to regulate competition, uh, or to think about how shocks could actually change competition and what we should do about that. This may even be irrespective of inflation, but may, may also be in order to, um, you know, to fight adverse effects of shocks transmitting through the economy in a particular way that um, um, competition changes and through that may be uh, affecting inflation. Since it's not entirely clear, at least in my uh, viewpoint, whether and how these gains in market share translate into inflation, uh, we need to think about this a bit harder because of economic policy, yeah? because that could mean that maybe this is a re result of demand-side policy, uh, monetary policy being too expansionary maybe at some um, points in time, but that would be a di completely different economic policy conclusion than saying we have to, um, for example, tax profits as some of the prominent commentators in the greedflation um, debate have done um, in order to fight inflation, which is, I think, not a clear takeaway from your paper, at least just yet. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Almut. Would you like to react to the discussion yeah, first, and me, then we take yeah, a couple of thank questions? Thank you. Let, let me briefly respond, and uh, thanks a lot for um, uh, the excellent uh, discussion. I would like uh, to um, push back uh, mostly on, on two points. Uh, if I um, uh, took my data, I didn't consider uh, the effects within an industry Obviously, I would observe that the price increases are larger in um, constrained uh, industries, okay? So I have to look within an industry, as, and I'm not sure what uh, you really look in your uh, graph that uh, seems to be uh, inconsistent with uh, my evidence. I would have to read uh, your paper. But uh, what I want to highlight is, um, obviously it would be nice uh, to have uh, price level data, and uh, given the approach that we have uh, taken in this particular paper, uh, it would be probably another paper. I would say that uh, we have shown that uh, there is uh, an effect on uh, um, prices, because we do this uh, looking at the markup and the cost shock. So basically, since we are aware that we don't have uh, prices, uh, we look at, uh, we think of an industry as having uh, an homogeneous product uh, and uh, one price, uh, and then if we observe that uh, the markup, that is uh, the profit per unit sold for a company uh, that is large increase, uh, we would uh, think that uh, this is uh, related to a decrease in competition. And uh, obviously it's very important uh, to, um, so we know that uh, there are shortages in an industry, but it's of course uh, important uh, to measure these uh, uh, firm level exposure. And um, so the, the direction in which we are going, uh, that was uh, not yet in the paper, so I apologize, uh, is uh, really going and zooming in with uh, this uh, shipment. But uh, of course, we can look also at more uh, survey data that are probably reserved, right? Or, yes. But uh, I, will, uh, I will check it. Yes. So. But I think the shipment is something that we really observe, and we don't have to rely on what companies say. So. Thank you very much. So uh, we have time for some questions from the audience. Otherwise, Diego also. Okay, please. Is it okay? Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. I wonder. I find interesting the endogenous effect on the degree of uh, market concentration of mm -hmm. HHI. Do you have any sense, uh, or potentially, will be something to look at? Um, what whether is persistent. So whether these effects that you, they may cause, uh, whether they last, because they will of course imply not about an effect, not only about the current level of inflation mm -hmm. that it may have, but how it changes also uh, for future shocks that may continue. Yes. And the second point or related question was, 
You mentioned resilience uh, and you mentioned inventories for resilience. I wonder, I wonder whether um, network of alternative suppliers may also play mm -hmm. a role. I think of also how many they are engaging with a bigger uh, company. If I think of the banking literature, multiple relationships, one gets hit, you can easily switch to something else. And if you think this uh, superstar firm may already engage with a multiplicity of alternative suppliers, that may allow them more flexibility. And I wonder if, mm -hmm. if, if there's something you could you do about that. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the question. So, so um, on uh, the dynamic effects, uh, is, um, I didn't show because we still have very large uh, standard deviation and um, um, I guess that the future indexes that are more precise will help us in that direction. But uh, we observe that uh, the effects on market shares are persistent. Uh, probably there are uh, differences in investment. Uh, that, uh, but uh, the effects on uh, profitability are not. Suggesting that uh, there is uh, some market uh, contestability that um, makes uh, this uh, effect uh, transient. Okay. So the effect on the, um, the question about uh, the res uh, resilience uh, is, um, it is undoubt, without a doubt, that star companies may be more resilient. And what I showed on the assortative matching, to some extent, goes in that direction, in the sense that, well, star firms have suppliers that are more resilient. And we can, we can also look at their supply chain and look at whether they are more diversified and so on. And this is, uh, to some extent, also important from the point of view, um, from the w for the way in which you interpret the analysis, meaning that the grid deflation is just well is uh, exercise of market power and uh, uh, an increase in profit that uh, perhaps the uh, antitrust authority should address. On the other end, if some companies are more resilient, this is a part of their intangible asset and their investment that must be remunerated. And to, to some extent, also for this reason, we were more positive from the point of view of the description of the empirical evidence rather than normative, at least so far, in our implications. Thanks. So I have Frank and then Diego. My question is related to the, to the question about uh, persistence. Mm -hmm. um, the, the effect on market concentration, is it mostly through the intensive margin or the extensive margin? I mean, have you looked at exit of firms? And in that case, uh, no, you can have more permanent effects. So, I mean, this is, uh, again, an, an excellent question and uh, it's also mm, important. What I showed you, must be considered entirely through the intensive margin, but this is because of the nature of my data, because I am working with um, listed companies' data. So to some extent, the mechanism that we have in mind is relatively weak in the larger listed companies that we are working with in WorldScope. It is uh, entirely possible that uh, these uh, shortages uh, drive uh, cost uh, to infinity for relatively smaller firm. And what I would uh, expect uh, to observe uh, if I go to a data set like uh, Orbis uh, is uh, that uh, there is also exit. But uh, we didn't go in that uh, direction yet. Great paper and great discussion. I mean, lots of very interesting facts and and that I think provide lots of uh, you know uh, nuisance to the to the to the different colors and shapes of capacity constraints, and and how that impact prices of different players. So I like a lot also the discussion facts. Now I have a question regarding the interpretation of your of your driving variable, which is the you know this this uh, delay in, in mm -hmm. shipment. I mean, that could be driven both by, by direct shocks to capacity, negative shocks to capacity, or to increasing demand. It could be the case that like, you are delayed because there's lots of demand. And so this increase in demand could have independent effects on pricing, on pricing, on pricing policy and pricing practices, okay? 
uh, that could be asymmetric also across across these two different types of firms. Yeah. So so I, I w that's that's my only you know yeah. word of caution about this. But yeah. but I I love the notion that like you know if you find a company that's that is more resilient you know that has a, a better a better network than another one then you know, a, a negative supply chain shock is going to affect it less and that's going to affect their pricing and obviously their market shares. Right? I think that's very interesting. So I completely agree with what uh, you just uh, said. We started from these uh, delivery delays because uh, we thought, well, okay, there is uh, shortages, of course, that can derive from supply. There is a port close or can derive from an increase in demand. Everyone wants to buy a bike, right? And um, at the beginning, we thought, well, we want to see how these companies are splitting the market. But you are entirely right, and we are equally concerned that a demand shock at the end can be asymmetric between firms, meaning that uh, there, is, there are supply chain uncertainty. We want to go to the, all to the more, most reputable suppliers, right? And uh, I think that would affect too much the interpretation of our result for us to be comfortable with it. So this is precisely the reason why um, we bought this maritime shipment data, because in that case, we would really observe how many relationships are close, uh, how many customers uh, during a, a given quarters uh, do not receive a shipment. And for instance, Ale Tisinski at Yale uh, has been developing a supply chain risk, uh, um, no, a supply chain shortages index based on those uh, shipment data. That would allow us to get closer to an interpretation based on a supply chain shock. That's, uh, of uh, deliveries uh, that uh, don't arrive for uh, exogenous reason. That is, at the end, what we would like to measure. But uh, otherwise, I agree that uh, this uh, alternative explanation uh, ought to be ruled out. OK, so thank you very much for this first part of the first session. We're going to have a break now until 5 past 12. So I invite you to grab a coffee, but also please Visit the posters, we will have a poster session, meet the authors, and then looking forward to seeing you again for the third paper. Thank you.